I'm not actually going to answer this question, okay? But I will provide some hints. But first, okay, I build robots for search and rescue, like this robot here. We call this the Terminator bot. Now, it's a small robot, about the size of a soda can, because I want it to go deep into the rubble to search for survivors, okay? Um, <clears throat> to a, a robot, to me, is a mechanism that combines three things, perception, cognition, and actuation. In other words, it can sense, think, and act. Now, what my robots need to think about are things like this. This was taken in northern Japan just a few weeks ago. Um, and to make my robots think, I use conventional computer chips. But as a consumer of computers, I'm worried. Okay? Because my robots are small. They have to do a lot of thinking without draining their batteries. Conventional technology for computers is really reaching its limits. Okay, both in terms of compute power and battery power. So, consider this though. Watson, the computer that won on Jeopardy, is a room-sized machine, okay, that consumes about 80 kilowatts. And you compare that to the human nervous system, it's about the size and weight of a laptop, okay? Consumes about 20 watts. Okay, but it can think, it can problem solve, it's creative, it can remember, it can even sustain significant damage and last for 80 or 90 years. Okay? I'm lucky if my laptop can make it through the week without a reboot. Okay, so what are we doing wrong? Well, the, uh, my robots, in addition to this computing problem, have hit another wall, quite literally. Right? They hit these broken walls in that they're trying to navigate and just can't get to the places they need to go. Okay, so we need some new solutions. Who's thinking uh, science fiction right about now? Right? <laughs> I love, thank you, thank you. I love science fiction. Right? I get great ideas from science fiction. And I also love the conundra that science fiction portrays about technology, its uses for both good and evil. Who remembers the bad guy from the movie Terminator 2? Anybody? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Liquid Metal Man, right? <laughs> Liquid Metal Man, this is great. As a roboticist, I fell in love with this, right? Even though he's totally evil. As an engineer, you know, he can form into different shapes and get lift, soft, flow like a liquid, hard like a solid. And look at this, right? The cool thing here is even while he's changing, transforming, still in control. It's a liquid that thinks. Okay? And, you know, this, it keeps forming while it's transitioning. It's not just forming a CPU inside. Okay? Again, it's this idea of a liquid that thinks. Now think about the possibilities for search and rescue. Okay? Not only could, could a liquid metal man pour itself down into the bottom of, of uh, a, a rubbled environment, right, to look for survivors, it could pour itself over a broken bone to act as a cast. It could pour itself over an injured person like a power suit. Okay? <laughs> it could pour itself over container, you know, hazardous substances to containerize them and keep harmful substances away. There are lots of other applications of something like this in medical robotics and in gaming and all kinds of things. Okay, but this is just science fiction. The question is, let's consider why is it just science fiction? The, the computers of today are based on technologies that actually evolved back in the 1930s, long before silicon transistors and even computers existed. Alan Turing proposed a universal computing machine based on simple operations that sequentially, step by step, you could compute anything that was computable, and hence, universal. Okay? Now, that has been the basis of building our machines ever since, this step-by-step -step universal computation. First, we used vacuum tubes, then we moved to transistors, then integrated circuit chips to form central processing units, or CPUs. But, Biological creatures don't do that, right? The thinking of a biological creature is distributed. It's not isolated, okay? If you cut off a chicken's head, it can still run around for quite some time, okay? Just like liquid metal man. <laughs> now, distributed computation like this has been tried many times, okay? Um, and the problem is our computer programmers and our computing programming tools are our geared, geared toward this step-by-step -step computation, okay? So, so that's our first challenge, right? We need to change the paradigm of computing. 
But this raises another challenge, right? It's a fabrication challenge. It's positional uncertainty. What does that mean? Liquids, the molecules in the liquid, they move around, right? They float, they bob, they don't maintain order. And that's not consistent with our fabrication of today, okay? So let's ignore the thinking liquid for a minute. What if we had a thinking rubber or a thinking gel? Okay? Even liquid metal man is solid most of the time. So thinking polymers, I think, can lead to whole new worlds of design and exploration. Right? And the cool thing is, is they're not that far away. We're working on structured computational polymers. Okay? Computational polymers that sense, think, and act in one material. Now, can't pour things like this into a building, okay? But they could potentially ooze and squeeze into some real tight places. So the next challenge becomes, how would we make a polymer think? Remember, distributed thought is a, bi a biological model. It's kind of radical from a computer model, but it's kind of conventional from the biological world because the natural world does this distributed thought all the time. Okay, so to make a rubber think, we need to distribute thought just the way she does in a headless chicken. Distribute sensors and neurons throughout the body to create a synthetic neural network. Okay, so what does that mean? What is a neural network? Well, a neural network is a collection of neurons that are wired together. Okay, well, what's a neuron? A neuron consists of a biological entity that consists of two basic parts, the synapse, and the soma, or the body of the neuron. Now, these two parts do three basic things. The synapse weights the inputs. The soma, then, takes the inputs, sums them up, and produces an output. Pretty simple. Now, in electronics, um, summing circuits make up the re made up of resistors are pretty common. And we've designed a real clever circuit to make the soma. But that's not the hard part, OK? What's hard is the synapse, the weighting of the inputs. And it's the weighting these inputs is the essence of learning in biological creatures. So the immediate challenge for us is how do we make a synthetic synapse? So we got to go back to the history books on this one. In the 1970s, a guy by the name of Chua imagined something was missing in the world of electronics. You see, the basic electronic uh, components are the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor, and they represent these four quantities. But you can see that something seems to be missing. And Chua got the same realization, okay? And thought, well, the equations suggest this thing would behave like a resistor with a memory. And so he named this mythical thing a memristor. Now, a resistor adjusts electronics in a wire just like a synapse adjusts signals in a neuron. But unlike resistors, synapses can change their value. That's the essence of learning. So if we had a memristor, a, a resistor with a memory, that uh, could remember synapse, synthetic synapse. Fantastic and, and intriguing combination, but so is a unicorn. They don't exist. OK, but in the last 10 years, weird nanotechnology metals have created these weird labs all around the world. And in 2008, some Hewlett's Packard researchers put together this article from Chua and their work and said, we found the memristor. Okay, and this shows the four stages that a memristor can exhibit. And we've been building these, not out of metals, but polymers. These are synapses we can print. And so we've been creating these uh, polymer sense, think, act structures separately, but we're starting to create computational polymers, this layer by layer or approach to create a thinking rubber. Okay, and so this is like a 2D sheet material. We can print these things. Printing leads to spraying, spraying leads to stirring, stirring leads to liquids that can think. Well, okay, it's not that quite that easy. Um, but what we have created is smart, intelligent robotic tethers out of these linear devices that can actually allow us to push on a rope. Well, that's not quite pouring into a building, but it's an important step, okay? So if we put these thinking materials all in one, I think this is going to revolutionize design. Right? No longer is the CPU a part of something, it is the thing. Right? Liquid Metal Man is science fiction. But science fiction is not a predictor of the future. Okay? If we just imagined Liquid Metal Man, what have we not yet imagined? 
I predict liquid metal man is just a drop in the bucket. Okay? He pales in comparison to what your kids, the engineers of tomorrow, will be designing with these new intelligent materials. Thank you. <laughs>